morning, church. I've missed you. I've missed this. Two whole weeks of snow and ice. It's just, oh. All right. I hope those words blessed you. Uh, that's, that right there is worth it. Worth it just the price of admission coming. Thank you, band. And praise members always leading us to the throne. You guys are awesome. Love it. There was two London filmmakers I read about this week. It was several years ago, and they began to film a movie that seemed a little odd. It was called Street People. You might have seen it. It was a famous documentary. And the whole purpose of it was to go and capture the daily struggles, the ups and downs and the good and the bad, of homeless people in London. It seems like a strange movie, like, oh, get the popcorn ready for that, right? But it's, it had this profound effect that was totally unexpected. When they went to mix this uh, documentary, a film, if you were, something strange happened. They began to look, and obviously there were people that were you know, not doing well. Some were on drugs. Some were intoxicated. Some were just mentally not in their right state of mind. But some had a different outlook. And one of England's most famous musical composers was this man right here. His name's Gavin Bryars. And he said, you know what, I will come in, I will bring my award-winning expertise to this documentary, and I will handle all the audio aspects of this film. So he went into the studio with what he thought was the finished product of this movie. And he began to put his headphones on. He's up in this studio, huge studio in London, people working all over this, this floor. And he's listening, and he became aware of something strange. There was a, a bizarre undercurrent happening in the background. And he couldn't understand, was it a buzz, was it a hum? He wasn't really sure what it was, but it was so strange. And it only appeared any time the camera panned over to this one homeless guy. Any time he'd pull away, it would disappear. And he said, this is so strange. So he got in the studio, put the headphones on, he started doing all the filters, started doing noise reduction and all the things that, that he can do. And he found out after removing the background noise that this one particular homeless man was singing. And he was singing a lot. He would sing for hours. So Gavin Breyers went and says, hey, you got to tell me more about this guy. And it turns out this guy wasn't just a normal homeless beggar. He wasn't drinking. He wasn't on drugs. He, he, he was a loner. But he had this, this strange joy, even in the midst of his filth and his solitude and his homelessness. He had the most optimistic, sunny outlook. But what further distinguished him on this film was his constant, quiet singing. And it would go on for hours and hours. The same thing over and over. This man's weak voice, it was so untrained, but it never wavered from the pitch. And Gavin leaned in, he listened, and he said, I think I hear a pattern. And he looked at it, and it was 13 measures of the same tune over and over and over that he was singing. And he said, I wonder if I put a symphony, bring them in and orchestrate this and turn this into a hit. I wonder if there's something magical here. This could be the, the, the hit of the homeless. You know, maybe we'll give the proceeds to the homeless or whatever. He wasn't sure what it was, but he knew he had something. So he looped this together, and he started playing in the studio, and he got up to go downstairs and get a cup of coffee, forgetting that he left it on. Several minutes later, he comes up the stairs, and he's shocked by what he sees. The entire studio floor was inside his private studio. He had left inadvertently that singing on over and over. And his entire crew had gathered inside and they sat in stunned silence. And as he looked closer at them, he saw they were openly weeping. Something had happened while he was downstairs. They started to listen to the words of what he was saying and it was so incredible. They were so moved. It had transformed this entire office and studio floor. Here are the words he was singing over and over. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. There is one thing I know, for he loves me so. It was this incredible, powerful moment. What a message. What a reminder for us. You want to talk about a heavenly perspective? That's what we've been talking about. This whole last several weeks as we've been redeeming the time. You remember our anchor verse comes from Ephesians chapter 5. And it says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So redeem the time. Not only are they evil, but here's the good news. They're numbered. That good news? Yeah, your days are numbered. My days are numbered. Y'all, that gives me hope that we don't look around at this struggle and think this is it. 
We're supposed to redeem the time, not for selfish pursuits, not for what you want, not for what I want, but to do the will of the Father. That is our daily pursuit. Man, I know there's a big challenge to hit you with out of the gate, but you know I got to ask, <laughs> how you doing with that? Are you redeeming the days to do the will of the Father? You've been coming these last few Sundays. Even Wednesday nights, we've been sharing this. If you missed any, we've, we've got a, a huge list of principles from the life of Jesus. And the first one is this. We're supposed to start with the word. This is where it all starts and ends. It's not about your feelings. It's not about my feelings. It's about what God's word says. That is our standard. It doesn't change. It doesn't get voted up and down. It doesn't get edited. It doesn't get rewritten. And it certainly doesn't get redefined. It starts and ends with God's word. Principle number two we looked at several weeks ago. Let your yes be yes. Is this... Your integrity here? Does, does what you say go? Do people understand when you say, hey, I'll be there, I'll be there? When I say, no, I'm not going to do that, you don't give in? Does your yes mean yes? Your no mean no? Because Jesus said anything more than that comes from the devil. <laughs> Man, that is powerful stuff. Principle number three we learned, dissent from the kingdom of noise. Just refuse. I'm not going to be part of the noise. I'm not going to contribute to that. Number four, prioritize your yeses. You can only say yes to so many things. And know this, this is tough, but every time you say yes to something, you're ending up saying no to something else. Is it something better? Have we said yes to good things only to be able to say no to the greatest things, to our family, to our faith, to redeeming the time? The next principle we see, accept your unipresence. Aha, we're all familiar with omnipresence. Unipresence. Just like Jesus, who had all the limitations you had, he could only be in one place at one time. We can only be one place at one time, so accept that. And know that. The last principle we looked at Wednesday night, embrace productive rest. Woo, yeah, everybody likes this one. Sleep. And we talked about some awesome benefits of what it means to observe the Sabbath, to Shabbat, to literally stop in the midst of the chaos. Today we unpack the seventh, the final principle. If you're taking notes, here it is. Eliminate all hurry. To redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we must Embrace productive business, that's okay, but we have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. Okay, throughout this series, we've talked about this. Jesus, even though his life was drastically different in first century Jerusalem, he had the same pulling on his time that you do. In fact, I would say he had a much weightier mission than you and I will ever feel. He had the same time constraints. He felt the pressure to be hurried just like us. In fact, when you look at the Gospel of Mark, when they're talking about Jesus, Mark uses one word more than any other over and over and over, and that's this word right here, immediately. It's not an accident. In fact, no less than 40 times Mark uses this, and Jesus immediately had to do that, and immediately we left, and immediately we did this. It was just constant, go, 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 go. They were so busy. They were crazy busy, no less than 40 times. One time, Jesus was so busy, he couldn't even slow down and even eat. In fact, his family members started saying, I don't think he's right. They thought he had lost his mind. You can read about it in Mark chapter 3. Over in John chapter 11, we see Jesus, his disciples are trying to convince him, hey, listen, you've done a lot. Why don't you just come away? Why don't we just call it a day? Come on over here. We'll just, we'll just call it a day. And then Jesus looks at him and makes the most bizarre question. He says, are there not 12 hours in the day? What a bizarre question. Why does he even ask that? Well, the Cambridge Bible Commentary, as I studied this, it translates Jesus' words like this. Hey, guys, are there not 12 working hours of daylight in which man can labor without fear of stumbling? I have not yet reached my end of the working day. So I can safely continue the work that I've come to do for the Father. Night is coming. I'll give you that. And I will no longer be able to work. But it hasn't come yet. This is so funny because it reminds me, I found this new show. I don't endorse it. I, don't, I hadn't seen a whole lot to know about it. But has anybody seen this goofy show right here, Shipping Wars? Anybody? All right. Two people. That explains it, right? I don't even know what channel. I think it's on the Discovery or A&E, one of those, right? Yeah. Okay. Here's the deal. Two-second recap. These truckers all over the world are bidding to take these loads across the country. Tons of miles, thousands of miles, and they're paid by the mile. They get, this, they get this quota, and if they're really lucky and they've got hours left on their logbook, they can stack several runs. They can take this giant gnome, and they can take an arcade game, and as long as they're going in a similar direction, they can make major bank because it's already paid for by the first load. Does that make sense? And they've got time. 
But sometimes they have to say no to a load. You know why? Because their logbook says they've used up all their hours. They can't drive more than 18, 20 hours in a given period before they have to sleep. And if a cop pulls them over and says, hey, let me see your logbook, and he says, uh, sir, you don't have any hours left in your day. Here's a $1,000 fine, and can I see your license? See what happens? They're able to say yes to some when they have enough time left on their logbook, but sometimes they have to decline a load that they really want because they've used up all their hours. And the disciples were pulling Jesus away going, hey, man, you've been busy. You know what? Maybe it's, why don't you call it a little early? Why don't you knock off? But when the night finally did come, look at what Jesus said. He was able to pray this to his father. He said this, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Did you catch that? I finished the work. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what I want as disciples? We've seen over these past few weeks, Jesus was so motivated to finish the work that his father gave him. He was about his father's business. What about us? Don't say anything. Don't look at your spouse or your neighbor. Just go back to the last seven days. How much of your time was devoted to accomplishing your father's work? Not your earthly father, your heavenly father. Was it hours? Minutes? do anything. I'll tell you this, we were busy. Probably not one of us was bored. Think about that. And as I look at this, here's the deal, and this is what I don't want you to, this is your big takeaway. Jesus was so, so busy. He was obviously busy, but the Gospels never once show him hurried. Do you know the difference? When you look at the life of Jesus, what a huge difference between being busy for the Lord and being hurried. See, when we're hurried, we don't resemble the master. And I've asked about this on Wednesday night. I said, what, do you, what kind of God do your neighbors see you serve? They see one who never lets them rest, who's constantly go, 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 and is frantic and pulling their hair out and going from one thing to the next? Or do they see a God whose burden is light and whose yoke is easy? If you had to define today, if someone came up and said, hey, what's the difference between being busy for the Lord and being hurried? Could you define it? There's a great book called Soul Keeping. Pastor John Ortberg wrote that. Check out what he says. He says this. There's a difference, a world of difference between being busy and being hurried. Being busy is an outward condition. It's a condition of the body. It occurs when we have many things to do. Okay? We all fit this. Okay? Busyness is inevitable in our modern culture. And by itself, busyness isn't lethal, okay? By itself, that's not going to kill you. Being hurried, however, is an inner condition. It is a condition of the soul. Oh, this is getting deep here. It means to be so preoccupied with myself and my life that I'm unable to be fully present with God, with myself, and with other people. I am unable to occupy this present moment. We talked about being present in this moment, right? Now, check this out. Busyness migrates to hurry when we let it squeeze God out of our lives. Did you catch that? Read that last line again. Busyness becomes hurry when it squeezes God out of our lives. This is so easy to do. I know it is. So easy to race out of bed and forget to even talk to the Lord. So easy to get your kids on the bus and say, oh, we'll, we'll catch that devotional later, buddy. It's so easy to give into that. But Jesus said, guys, what is your priority? Busyness, let's see how this looks in our everyday life, okay? Let's say you have a lot of meetings on your calendar. Busyness is having several meetings in a row on your calendar. Hurry is scheduling those meetings back to back to back to where you are sprinting from one to the next without any time to even stop and hear your own thoughts. You see the difference there? Okay, busyness is having a lot of errands to run. We all get that. Hurry is... <laughs> is getting mad that you chose the wrong checkout lane at the grocery store because you cannot bear the 30 extra seconds it took because you chose lane three instead of lane four. See, we're, we're grinning because you've been there, right? We always pick, every time I go to a toll lane or something, I always pick the wrong lane. And it is a divine test of my flesh. 
I, you know, I'm, I'm open, right? Sometimes I will, little, I will have to hold my arm out, and Amy will stroke it and say, easy, easy, Pastor. Settle, Tiger. It's okay. I'm like, it's not okay. It's not, they, they're not prepared for it. No. Just chill, dude. Well, just being honest, full disclosure. Busyness can even happen in our spiritual life. We can be so busy chasing Bible studies, doing spiritual things. You know, like let's say you, got, you go to a small group, and then you go to morning worship, and then you come to Wednesday night, and then you go to BSF. You got that. That's business. Hurried is not stopping and digesting anything and giving God a chance to speak to you, where you are literally having indigestion because you've gone and gone and gone, but you've not paused before the Father to hear that voice between those studies. The truth is, and you know, we're safe here. We don't have to pretend. It's the potter's hand. That's what I love about it. Every one of us is busy, and we're probably hurried. There's just one problem with that. That's not the way of the Redeemer. That's not the way of Jesus. He's not the model. Uh, he doesn't show us this frantic going around. We are too hurried. Have you ever done something, you've been in such a hurry that you've done something foolish that you regret, or maybe something stupid, or maybe hilarious, or, or all three at the same time? True story. Several years ago, I was not preaching on this particular Sunday. It doesn't matter who was. Okay, I'm just going to leave it very vague. I get a text. Countdown clock's already started, and this particular preacher was getting used to our countdown clock, and what's, what's happening here now? I need to be out. And I get a text, and it's about two minutes left on the countdown clock, and the text says, I need help. Can you come to me? I was like, um, sure. <laughs> Where are you? In the bathroom. <laughs> um, okay. So I go to the bathroom, and this particular preacher is holding this pack. You all know what this pack is? This, this is the transmitter, the battery pack? And he hands it to me and says, I don't think it works. I said, well, how did you, why, what, do you, what makes you? And then I saw that it was soaking wet. And I said, what? He says, I might have dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> I said, might have dropped before or after, you know what, I don't even want to know. I just, he was so embarrassed, but he was in a hurry. And because he was, he missed the pocket and bloop, right? You ever do something like that? What causes us to be so busy? What causes us to have that level of hurry in the first place? A lot of things are external, but there are some internal things, but probably the most practical one, our hurry comes from our failure, and be ready for this, I'm just going to throw it out there. It comes from our failure to count the cost. So many times. So many times we, we forget to count the cost. And counting the cost is an accounting term. And Jesus actually used it. And he uses it in this great parable called counting the cost. And, and it's when the disciples, it's over in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to look at it in just a second. But I want to set the context because it is one of the heaviest, deepest passages that Scripture ever records Jesus talking about. He's in the middle of this important, heavy teaching about what it really means to follow him. And what does it really look like to be a follower of Christ and forsake all? And he starts laying it down, man. He is not holding it back. And this is where he makes that famous, shocking statement. If anyone doesn't forsake everything, mother, father, wife, sister, brothers, even your own life, if you don't forsake everything and you're not willing to bear your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Don't you think people hearing that were just like, well, who can? You know, did the crowd just kind of turn, thin out? You can't be my disciple if you're not. Y'all, you know, this was unheard of. Remember, back then, before the advent of Christ, family was central to everything, even religiosity. Family was highest priority. So when he comes along and he says, no, 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 Father, God should be the center of one's life. Y'all, this was radical. And it required serious counting of the cost, okay? So that's the context. Look at what he says next in verse 28 of Luke 14. He says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, Ha! This is the man who began to build and wasn't able to finish, right? You must be so embarrassed. What a dork. I can't believe it. This guy, ah, he's the laughing son. Think about this. Some of us have been right there. Some of us have bitten off more than we can chew in a 24-hour day, and we ended up looking like a goof, right? 
For some of us, we see all the, this is like a pretty typical Tuesday. This is what we do. We constantly overload our schedules and we don't look like our Redeemer. We do this with our work. We do this with relationships. We even do this with our playtime, with our leisure. What is wrong with us? We love to spend time with our family. You love your kids. I love my kids, and every kid's different. And, and when we spend time with them, every one of my kids wants to do something different. And that doesn't mean something I want to enjoy, but for Milo, he loves to play old arcade games with his old man. This is what he likes to do. And it's fun, and I get it. Now, I will give a quarter to anyone who can identify what that video game is. Does anybody recognize what that is? Close, close, not, close, not quite as graphic and bloody. It's close to tech, and it came out in the same era. This is, can we zoom in? Then maybe it'll give them a little help. Can you see it just a little bit? It came out around the same time as Golden Axe. This is Magic Sword. Magic Sword, oh, so good. I've lost many a dollar to this game. <laughs> Almost lost a relationship to my wife to this game. I'll tell you, tell you about that later sometime. Maybe I won't. Milo really wants to win this game. Okay? There's just one problem with it. You can't pause it can't stop it, and it's 49 levels. Each level takes a long time. It's 49 levels, and so we play a few, and then we said, Milo, we gotta go turn it off, right? He wanted to start it, and I told him, Milo, listen, I know you wanna win the game, but you're not gonna be able to finish it. Look down the road at your schedule. Here's what's gonna happen, let me paint it out. You're gonna get to like the 37th level, have invested two hours of your life in this, and then we're gonna have to go to school or you're going to have to go to Kappa, or we're going to have to go somewhere, and we're going to have to turn it off. You're going to be mad, probably at me, <laughs> which isn't my fault, because we didn't look down. Do you really have time to complete the task, right? Look ahead. Is it really wise to begin if you can't complete the task? That's counting the cost. And Jesus himself has this incredible episode that you've read, but I bet you didn't see what I'm about to show you. It is so cool, so profound. It's in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Check this out. Jesus enters Jerusalem, and he goes into the temple courts, and he looks around at everything, but since it's already late in the day, he goes back out to Bethany, okay, it's just outside the, the, the city walls, and he goes there with the 12, okay, so he leaves, end of that night, are you with me? Look what happens next, skip on down. On reaching Jerusalem, he comes back, Jesus enters the temple courts again, and now he begins driving out those who are buying and selling there. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. You remember the other account? He makes a whip, and he drives around. He calls them a den of thieves, and he has this huge set. Okay, did you catch it? There is something very odd here that I have always missed. I didn't even catch it until just this past week. Jesus goes to the temple, and he looks around, and he sees everything. So he has a very strange response of what he does next. Think about this. Jesus sees it all. He is full, fully aware of what is happening, but he leaves. Remember, he had to have seen all the same bad stuff going on. And Jesus, he knew it was wrong then. He knew all along he was going to have to unleash some righteous indignation here, because we know he's about to. All these people are practicing evil. They're making the, uh, the Father's house no longer a house of prayer, but a den of thieves. And the tables are coming. All those crazy vendors, he's going to drive them out. So why did he not do it right then? Why did Jesus wait until the next day? I've never thought about that. Remember, Jesus was busy, but he was never hurried. Think about this. Given his track record as a busy but not hurried man, I think Jesus was counting the cost of his time right here. I think he had a magic sword moment. He looked at this, and he decided... It sounds like not to cram any more activity into what had already been a ridiculously busy day. Go back and read Mark uh, 11 sometime. You'll see it. it's the triumphal entry. The donkey, got to go get that. He rides in. He has the crowds and the Hosanna. People are doing the pom-poms and the pom fronds and all this stuff. And he's finally inside the temple. It's at the end of a long day. And you can almost picture him looking around, right? He's got his hands on his hips. He's in the temple. He's checking it out. He's not digging what he sees. And if you lean in close, I wonder if you could almost hear him mumbling under his breath. It can wait. It can wait. Let's go. You can almost picture it. And he leaves. But then he comes back. Remember, why did he do that? 
Could Jesus have squeezed in a little more table flipping in that moment? Absolutely. He could have. But then adding anything to his already busy day would have tipped the scales from busy to hurried. And when you add those two words together, you add busy plus hurried, you get another word that is awful, and it is harried. This is a true word, right? It's not like one I made up. Harried literally means bothered by too many problems, too many worries, too many anxieties. And y'all, that is where we are as a culture. You see how the Bible is so alive for us today? Think about this. The very definition, you are harried, you have added busyness and hurried, and to redeem our time in the model of our Redeemer, we have to, just like Jesus, embrace being busy and effective for the Lord by being ruthlessly eliminating all the hurry and the distractions that pull us aside. Okay? This is our final step in redeeming our time and resembling the Master more and looking more like our Redeemer. Think about what we've learned so far when we come to this. We know on Sundays and Wednesdays, we've talked about this. Start with the word. Let your yes be yes. Refuse to participate in the kingdom of noise. Prioritize your yeses. Accept the fact that you could only be one place at one time. Embrace productive rust. And today, eliminate all hurry. Here's the rub. Being a follower of Christ is not easy. And it's only going to get harder. Just know it. It's okay. We have each other. We have the Lord to rely on. Being a follower of Christ is not for wimps. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not the easy road. And Jesus never said it was going to be. He said, take up your cross, follow me, and die daily. It's not easy. But I'll tell you this. It is absolutely worth it. Following Jesus takes discipline. To be his disciple takes discipling. It's where we get the word discipline. To be a disciple means you are disciplined. So you know I gotta ask. Are you more disciplined in other areas in your life than you are being a follower of Christ? If so, today's the day to change it. It's okay if you realize that. That's great. It means you're moving forward. You're becoming more and more like the Redeemer. Jesus was so disciplined with his time on earth. And he is the one we are supposed to mimic. He is the one we imitate. He was so intentional about staying focused, about glorifying his father, that he would literally finish the work he'd given him to do. That's John 17, 4. Jesus, this example shows up in New Testament passage after New Testament passage. Probably the most famous one, the one I want to park on as we leave. And that's this one from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9. He says this, Don't you know that when people run on the racetrack, everybody runs, but only one person gets the prize? Run in such a way that you'll win it. Everyone who goes in for athletics exercises self-discipline in everything. They do it to gain a crown that perishes. We do it for an imperishable one. Well then, I'm not going to run in aimless fashion everywhere. I'm not going to shadow box like someone just punched in the air. No, I give my body rough treatment and I make it my slave so that, after announcing the message to others, I myself should not end up being disqualified. Did you catch that? As Christ followers, we don't run through life in an aimless fashion, but many of us are. Paul's saying, we're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to know what's up. We are called to practice self-discipline in everything. Did you catch that? This is what Paul also calls self-control. When he gets to Galatians 5, he's talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all remember that? Self-control. Discipline is a byproduct of a spirit-filled life. It's a byproduct of living a Christ-like life. All right, so listen up. As, as we close this series, as with any good thing, I want to give you a caution. I have seen it, and you probably have too. Too many good people make discipline the ultimate thing. And therefore, discipline no longer becomes a good gift. It becomes a curse. It actually becomes an idol. All right, let me, let me tell you the, the two warning signs. In fact, uh, musicians, you guys can go ahead and come on up. We're going we're gonna to sing our final song in just a minute. Here's two warning signs I want to leave you with to let you know you have crossed over to the dark side of discipline, okay? And you've turned a good gift into an idol. The first one is this. If we find ourselves unable to extend grace to others who are less disciplined than we are, danger, 
Danger. Warning, you've just crossed the line into arrogance and pride and judgmentalism and looking down your nose. Well, if they would just do what we do, if they would just get out of bed when it's 17 degrees and come to church, they would not have a marriage that's falling apart. <laughs> right? Seriously, think about this. If you are unable to extend grace to others who are less disciplined than you are, that's a warning sign. Remember, every good and perfect gift is from above, and it comes from the Father. James 1.17 tells us that. The ability to be disciplined about redeeming our time is a gift. It's a gift of grace, just like salvation. We didn't earn it, and no one can boast about it. So be gracious with your discipline. The second warning sign, this is going to hit home for everyone, is if you find yourself unable to extend grace to yourself. You beat yourself up. Man, I'm a loser. Missed my quiet time again, three days in a row. Haven't been to church in three weeks. Haven't been to a small group in eight years. I don't even know what they are. Right? If you begin to find you cannot extend grace to yourself, I'm going to remind us again, hear this. The gospel is freedom. Knowing Jesus brings good, not stress. His burden is light. His yoke is gentle on your shoulders. God doesn't need us to finish our to-do list in order to be approved by him. Hear me say that. Because if we don't capture that, we cross the line into legalism. That's not what God leaves for us. If we, if we don't understand this, he loves us and accepts us no matter how productive we are, no matter how good we are, no matter how many great things we do, because it is a gift knowing him. Look at verse 25. Go back just a little bit if you can, Connor. I want you to, everyone who goes in for athletics exercises self-discipline in everything. Why do they do it? They do it to gain a crown that fades away. We do it for an imperishable one. And there it is. Our crown doesn't fade. Literal treasures are being stored in heaven by the way you are a faithful disciple of Jesus. Did you know that? It's not just symbolic. This is real. Our life is even more real in the one to come than what we think and we can touch here. When we live for Christ, we are glorifying the Father. We are storing up treasures that will never fade. They will never perish. So let me encourage us with, when times get tough, some of you are in some tough times, remember the prize. Redeem the time. Stay faithful. I know it's hard, but it will be worth it in the end. We cling to his word. We cling to each other. He's coming back. Are you ready? Are you living your life in such a way that it is an offering that you can lay before him? And then you'll hear that one phrase you want to hear. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Maybe today's the time you just want to lay it at the altar and say, God, I have enough of the rat race. Will you reclaim my schedule? Will you reclaim my life? Will you help me redeem the time? Maybe you've got a family member that's struggling. I want to pray. If you're new here, what we like to do is in a minute, we just stand, we sing and worship one last time before we go. The altar's open. You'll see people kneeling and praying. No one will bother you if you want to come and kneel. There's something awesome about humbly kneeling before the Lord. Feel free to do that. If you want to stick around and talk after church, I'll stay as long as you want. God is here. He has spoken. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. Maybe you want to come and spend some time at the foot of the cross.